Yeah, go ahead, Curdy. Okay, so I can talk about the auto memory first. Um, okay. So up to this point, we have been receiving um, uh, different vectors of attack with the A lines of code and the round shim and and some related projects where, where the attacker effectively computes. This is sort of the general attack methodology is that you try to figure out how many functions you can recursively stack. And once you count that, you then use that counter to effectively execute another recursive um, process, uh, not process, but another recursive execution that uh, stops right up, right before overflowing the stack. And then you do an operation that you know is going to overflow and that operation will return, will throw an error and will give you access to an error intents that you do not, that, that you don't want to leak. I can show some examples of that um, just to get the, the context of what the problem is. I know that some of you are kind of already familiar with this. Let me see, how can I share here? Um, Okay, let me know if you see my screen. Uh, this one. Um, in the project that we're working on, we received something very similar uh, from one of the researchers and um, basically what they do here is they they have this piece of code that is supposed to run inside the sandbox and what they do is they create a recursive function that determines the the amount of functions that you can stack at the end of the invocation of this function you you get a, a number that number is the amount of functions that you can allocate into the stack. Um, once you know that number, you can attempt to do a very similar thing, which is another recursive Hello. function. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. You have a question? Alex, Testing one, two, three, can you hear me? Alex? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear Alex. I think you can hear All right, it. What's going on with my sound? I hope that you can hear it, Alex, because this is important for you as well. I continue or wait for Alex to? Oh, let's just see if it clears up in a sec here. Yeah, I'll uh, make a breakout room and see if I can figure it out with Alex. Okay, so you guys continue. Okay, okay so once you know the limit of the stack, you execute another function recursively up to the point where you are about to overflow the stack. And right at that point, you call something uh, that you know is going to overflow the stack. And that something is supposed to be a, something from the outer realm, something that you see through the membrane so no matter what kind of membrane do you have in here, if the thing that you are trying to call is going to be allocated in the stack, uh, the error that you're going to get might or might not be an error that belongs to your realm. That in this particular case, 
they are overflowing with the console log, which is in this particular project, something that is a proxy of the console log from the other realm. And what this causes is that uh, it throws an error, at the, a, range, a range error in this case, telling that the stack, uh, that you're out of memory, that the stack overflow, and you're going to get a reference error for the outer realm. That was the attack that they were using here. But the methodology is the same. You overflow the stack to know when is this is going to happen. Then you count the steps to do the overflow, and then you attempt to do the overflow on a particular operation that you know is going to give you the error from the outer realm. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, that does. Okay. Um, so the main point of the investigation that we did is that what kind of things can we do to prevent a, that any operations that you do against a membrane will give you an error from the other side? And it turns out that this is under specified in the specification. So if this function happens to be a proxy of a function from the outer realm, um, this function, if this function is declared here, in this scope, nothing is, not, nothing will happen because the error that you're going to get is an error associated to the realm that is associated to the function that is overflowing the stack or the function that is trying to allocate a new function into the stack, either of those two. Those are the two options at this point. And different browsers, they do different stuff. Uh, Firefox, I think, does some, some sort of a, uh, a random selection of which function you will take the wrong out of it or something like that. Um, in general, this seems to be uh, difficult to control. Um, Additionally, if the function that you're invoking happens to be a proxy, then there are even more problems because unless that the proxy identity belongs to the sandbox realm and the target of the proxy belongs to the realm and the traps that are being invoked, in this case the apply trap or the construct trap, are also uh, uh, or belong to the sandbox realm. If the, some of these conditions happens to be false, then you might get an error that belongs to the outer realm. So you have to have a complete separation of the um, in the membrane to guarantee that any operations that you do against the membrane from the sandbox are never ever um, using either a proxy from the outer realm or when I say proxy from the outer realm, I mean a, a proxy instance whose proxy constructor belongs to the outer realm. And so you have to guarantee that the proxy belongs to the sandbox, that the target belongs to the sandbox, and the traps belong to the sandbox. And even in those situations, you have to also guarantee that if the trap is using and is doing any interaction with the outer realm, you have to protect against that interaction. Those are the conditions that we found that are reliable. Um, so effectively, if this is a proxy, the proxy of a function the shadow target of that proxy must be a function that is declared inside the sandbox. And the traps of the handler for that proxy also belongs to the sandbox. And that's how we are able to control the, the, the stack overflow at this point. So far so good? Yeah, looks good. Um, I don't know if we have solved these in the past, um, but we have been able to successfully get away with a membrane implementation that is completely separate. That means that 
all the pieces that compose the membrane have to be evaluated inside the sandbox. And when they interact with the outer realm, um, you have to add protection there. Effectively try catch every time that you cross to the outer realm. And if it overflows on the other end, you have to do something to correct that error. And you have to make that error to belong to the sandbox effectively by throwing a new error or something like that. Um, it's, it seems that like it's hard to do, but it, it's doable. I, I feel that this, this is the, the important bit. It's doable that you can create a membrane that has these characteristics and, and uh, out of memory are never going to affect you if the membrane is accounting for that. Uh, what we did in this project was simply saying the thing that re relate between the two sides of the membrane is sort of a registry. And this registry is almost no code. Those are pretty much a registry uh, of weak maps. And then the operations that you do on those weak maps will not overflow um, the stack because you're not allocating a new function. Uh, and, and therefore, any communication with this uh, registry is safe. Um, but the minute you have to go and evaluate something from the outer realm, you have to put a try catch, but those are in a couple of places only. So it's easier to, for us to sort of manage what the, what the, um, what, the, what you could do through the membrane. And additionally, I believe there are, are gaps in the spec that we should fill out specifically around what does it mean for a proxy to overflow the stack and what kind of error you can get out of that. I believe we could do something about it by, by specifying that uh, the identity of the, of the proxy itself should be owner when you throw an error so you don't necessarily leak an error from the outer realm just because the target of the proxy is from the outer realm, something like that, which is what happened in Chrome today. I think all the other browsers are a little bit better than Chrome on this aspect because they don't do uh, any weird stuff. They they respect the identity of the of the of the proxy. That's it. And sixty yeah. minutes. Okay. Um, hey, Carrie D. Um, mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, there's also another way to, um, I think, uh, curb the problem, which is the uh, proposal uh, that Mark has uh, put forward regarding uh, termination. Right. Right. But so, that's, that one is a lot more invasive because you have to rethink the code that you have. So it doesn't work for legacy code. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, and, and the idea is to, in order to get around that problem with legacy code, is to make it more surgical. So, um, you can wrap uh, out of memory um, for a se specific section of code that you believe is uh, you need to be defensive against. So, it's the kind of a targeted try catch where. <laughs> Um, if inside of that try catch any out of memory of, um, execution happens, then the whole machine goes down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I feel that um, because at least the product that we are, well, you know, the product that we are working on, we need yeah. to allow people to just evaluate arbitrary libraries and uh, scripts in general, no, not necessarily modules only. It's going to be really hard to just go with anything that just um, automatically fills the entire process because it's going to be uh, too much, uh, uh, too aggressive effectively. Because what happens when that when this fails, then you you're going to throw away all the memory allocation and now the crashing the the tap or something like that for the app.
Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it looks like uh, for SES at least, uh, we may be looking more at metering options so that even if uh, the proposal made by Mark and, and yourself, Jeff, about the out of memory doesn't go through yet or isn't supported on a given platform, we may be able to do things like uh, instrument how much stack depth is used um, and thereby reserve some stack for primitives to run under. But uh, yeah, that's, you're right in that we need to either protect how proxies interact or else reserve some stack room. Yeah, I'm not sure if if this is a um, I haven't spent time thinking about what other things could affect the uh, the counting of the stacks. Probably some implementers can give us more details on that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be tricky. I feel that uh, if the membrane is well constructed and you put certain measurements there, um, it might be sufficient to control this problem uh, through a membrane. But at the same time, uh, it's not trivial. It's not trivial. We spend many, many weeks trying to figure out how, what to do here. And because it's under specified, it's just a guessing game what's going on and, and we, we try to play safe by just keep them completely separate. Like it's just completely separate and you never really have a way to evaluate code on the other end of the fence uh, without their side of the fence without a, a, the proper protection there. Yeah, it seems that if you are just able to normalize the behavior between the browsers uh, you might have an easy path because if some are already doing what is by accident, what is the right behavior for you, it might be easier to convince. Uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was very surprised that Chrome was behaving that way. And mm -hmm. when all the other ones were just picking up the identity of the proxy rather than the, the target or the, uh, or the trap. Yeah. So if the trap is the one that overflows, because it's a function that you're calling, um, right. uh, should the, the, the identity of the trap be used or should the identity of the proxy be used? And Chrome uses the identity of the trap. All browsers use the identity of the proxy that is about to call the trap. Um, or the, at least the proxy that allocate the trap in, in the stack. Uh, so is the allocator the one that defines the identity and that seems to be safer in in all cases that I looked at. Um, that's my opinion, but uh, Chrome seems to go with the other one. Like it's always about the thing that you're trying to allocate, what's the identity of it, and then you throw from there. Um, I know that out of memory uh, situations are really hard to uh, study and diagnose. What, could it be possible that it's the, the where the error occurs is different in the different uh, in the different browsers? Therefore, that would explain what is the current realm and uh, the type of error you're getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it could, could be, uh, but but I feel that if you are if you are interacting with a proxy, we we could specify what the behavior is expected in order for us to be able to. Um, uh, to protect against that kind of operation. Right. So th for the error we had uh, related to this in the realm that was presented to us in the past without like the, the, um, the uh, switching proxy, the one that switches between the different types of eval, uh, the error was ha actually happening at the getter. And um, as yeah, we're getting, because the, yeah, the get the getter. You mean the get trap? Yeah, the get trap. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And and that one is the one that probably overflows the stack. Exactly uh, for the for the typical typical use cases. So um, we um, 
yeah, what what we do, we just void, uh, we revoke the proxy when we detect that that type of behavior. But at least it was uh, not like we're in in control. And if we had the mechanism for that we're talking about for um, termination and overflow, then it's inside our shim code at least, so it's it's controllable. So that's one thing. The other thing is we're moving away from realm to realm. So we um, ev ev evaluating everything inside a single realm. So we we're not gonna have we don't have any co code now that needs to. Oh yeah, so you're, yeah. you're uh, but but even in that case, if you ever call any function from another realm, um, yeah, you have that issue. But if you, if, if you yeah. never have anything outside of the of the current realm. Uh, yeah. then you're, you're safe because the error is going to have the same identity. Exactly. So we we, we we run buckets. Yeah. Yeah. So we we try to stay the, in a single realm really, in our case. So as a way to avoid that and also to to tailor more platforms that don't have multiple realm web like access. Interesting. Was this reported or was this something you guys discovered? This is what this was reported. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, this person also reports something, a uh, few things on the wrong tune, if I remember correctly. MMIS 1000. Okay. Okay. Um, any, any other question about this one? Uh, Alex, I think, is. Doesn't have audio, I guess. Right. I'm here. Uh, my oh. audio is fixed. Um, unfortunately, I cannot offer any insight whatsoever into this, um, simply because I have been unable to get back to my own membrane project for quite a while. And I can tell you that errors, error handling is not yet supported. I would say, in ES membrane. So unfortunately, I have nothing that I can really help you here with. Okay. It's on my to-do list. All right. Um, okay. So I also have the second topic, I think. No, Michael, right? Uh, yeah, you're good to go. Okay, the second one is a little bit more, uh, I think, interesting because it's related to the role. And we don't have Marks. Marks is not here. But the idea is that uh, we have been debating. Uh, the interaction between the realm and the host for that realm. And the specification describes the interaction between the realm and the host um, very well. And up to this point, most of those in this group has been about, has been talking about the necessity for the new realm to not have any connection with the host. Um, but at the same time, this is very challenging because there are many cases in which you do want to get the ROM ready and do operations that, uh, that are host specific, like importing a module and such. And, and for that, you will have to either provide a set of APIs that allow you to control those operations and do uh, fulfill them. Um, in the context of the realm, uh, not necessarily. So you're playing the, as a creator of the realm, you're playing the role of the host and you are responsible for fulfilling those uh, connections. Um, uh, while uh, we have another camp at TC39 that I believe that the realm should respect the host behavior and the realm is not a thing that is isolated um, and is portable from one uh, engine to another one. It's just something that is very host specific. And we have been sort of uh, going back and forward about these two concepts and uh, these two models per se. Um, in the last conversation that we have, we have a tentative agreement on uh, allowing both modes of operations allowing the creation of a realm that is associated to the host 
and then also allowing the creation of a ROM that is running in isolation. It doesn't have any IO operations that go through the host. Um, and I, I believe Mark was okay with this as well. And we, he was supportive of this. Uh, the question was, how can we, what are the ergonomics of such um, uh, different modes or these different modes? And so I've been spending time on these and um, my counter proposal now is sort of a um, based on the current model of iframes basically where you have a single mode to create iframes. You create iframes and you um, forget about iframe for a second but you you will have a single way to create new realms, and those realms will always come with the host uh, association. And once you feel ready that you are going to disconnect that from the host, you can detach it from the host. And it's a um, it's a mechanism that will allow you to not only create having not only create realms that are detached from the from the realm, uh, so from the host, therefore they don't have any IO, they don't have modules, they don't have anything, they are running in isolation, but you also have the ability to initialize them when they are still connected to, to the host. And this is the same model that the iFriend uses. So when you create an iFriend and you append it to the DOM, uh, you're basically uh, providing host um, details that that allow you to do IO, like you have access to the network, you have access to um, evaluating code inside that, you're, you're allowed to, um, to evaluate modules and such, because you, are, you have a host that will back it up. And once you want to um, detach that iPhone, you just remove it from the DOM and it automatically gets uh, detached from the host. Um, and therefore, this iframe is hanging in memory. It still can do operations, but none of these operations can uh, talk to the outside world. Um, so the model that I'm proposing is a, a single creation process for the realm. So you do the creation of the new realm, you do operations on it, and when you're ready, you do the detach method. And the detach will effectively um, uh, detach you from, from the host operations and you're now in isolation in memory. That's pretty much it. Um, so I want to get some feedback on that um, and see if there is any problem with that. So if you, what you're talking about, Kerry, is that um, you can do some operation and then you lose, after you do those operations, you can call a method that would uh, remove those powers from, from yes. the realm. Yeah. Okay. And that would be called from the outside, so. Yeah, that, that's a, a method on the ROM intent. So you, you have to, yeah, you have to be a, you have to be the owner of the ROM to do that. Right. Well, it's interesting because we're looking at a um, similar API, which is we call for now lockdown, which is the uh, process mirrored on access which does a series of operation on the current realm in order to turn it into a CES realm, uh, freezing prototypes and, and, and whatnot. And so there's the same idea that you have a grace period where code can execute with full powers and then lockdown is called or a snapshot and uh, then you get into a secure mode or a, a limited power mode. That's interesting. Yeah, sounds very good. And it seems to mirror what you're talking about, uh, what you're trying to do currently, right? To detach uh, the yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you will be able to create a ROM, fetch some modules, get them ready. Um, uh, get the initialization, polyfilling, whatever you want to do. And then yeah. after that, you cut it out. Yeah. 
and that would be available only from the outside, right? Yes. Not from the inside. Yeah. yeah, it's the same in the iPhone. You cannot detach the iPhone itself. The owner of the iPhone have to detach you. Right. All right, that's it. That's all I have. Sounds good. Any any idea for the naming of that method? No, I haven't get to that <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, no, um, detach holds or something like that might be okay. Um, the oh, there is one more thing, uh, which is obviously if this is true, now there have to be some sort of um, connection between nested realms. So if it is a realm. If a realm creates another realm and the pattern realm is detached, what happened? It's going right. to be detached as well. Um, yeah. So there, there, this is that's a that's the, this new mechanism comes with some flavor there. So we have yeah. to figure out what the semantics is. But it seems that uh, it's easy to implement by just having a way to say. If, if you want to detach this iPhone, all the children's iPhones, uh, all the children's uh, realms will, will automatically, or the other realms created out of that realm, uh, automatically get uh, detached as well. Right. Uh, yeah, this, this touches something that we've noticed uh, over the past month uh, through the specification, which is the concept of realm uh, is really under specified, especially the realm to realm relationship in the current specs. Uh, there are very, very few cases where uh, more than one realm is uh, affecting operations as specified in, in, in the code. I can think of uh, reflect of construct probably as one of the only one that I'm, that I'm aware of that kind of leads to an interaction between multiple realms. But other than that, there's very nothing in the specs to talk, talk about that. So that exploration or that discussion you're talking about, about nesting realm, it's not really something that exists, like the concept of an inner realm, outer realm, there's nothing about that in, in the specs. And that, I think that will have to be defined. Okay, sounds good. Shall we move on to the third topic? I um I don't have a um, product. Uh, I, I didn't prepare for the third one, um, but up to this point, all the hooks that we were considering for the Realm API, and we were debating whether or not many of these hooks will go into the Realm API or the Evaluator API. Um, and every time that I look at one of the hooks, uh, they it ended up belonging to the Evaluator. So it's becoming more like, okay, what are, what are the hooks that we need for the Realm itself? And up to this point, I don't, I don't, I don't have any, any hook for the Realm. Um, which, if that's true, then it simplifies uh, a few things. So we'll have to determine what exactly are the hooks that we want for the, for the realm, knowing that the realm comes with a dummy, not a dummy, but an evaluator that is very simple, that you don't have the level of control that you have if you create the evaluator yourself. Um, and, and therefore, it's fine to not have hooks there. This is a regular evaluator. Right. Like the concept of a default evaluator is, um, it's interesting because it's, uh, it's very similar to the concept of a default uh, compartment. So compartment and evaluator is kind of a blurry line. Uh, we tend to see the evaluator as everything without the import hooks, uh, uh, anything without the module support. So probably those two will, uh, will merge. 
and um, you could see the realm as as a as we're trying to define it something that deals with host operation and intrinsics and it comes with uh, if inside it a default evaluator and then more evaluator can be uh, created or the other way is a realm comes with a default compartment and inside other compartments can be created yeah and the, the just so just to clarify the default evaluator for the realm uh will do support import yeah yeah, exactly. So that's why and, that's uh, why we we tend to merge to go toward the compartment there. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if you don't want modules, then you can detach it from the holes, and then you you don't get any modules. So yeah. Yeah. If you detach the route, yeah. So I feel that at this point there are no hooks, uh, and unless that someone come out with a hook that is a good hook yeah. for for the realm, then. Uh, yeah, we yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. One thing that we we've, we've been looking at is this concept of realm record, which um, can be very different for one platform to another the way it's implemented. But it's a it's a collection of of, uh, of slots uh, that travel together that happen to be created together when you create a realm, and. Um, not all platforms have all of the slots. Uh, XS, for example, doesn't have an intrinsic uh, slot in their realm. Um, so when we're looking at the compartment, everything that's currently in the realm um, needs to be at the compartment level, except for the intrinsics. And that's another way to say, well, um, all of the hooks we have to look at are dealing with everything else but the intrinsics. Uh, so uh, maybe the only hook or the only method that you will get on the, on the realm will be get intrinsics. And uh, um, yeah, that's probably what. Yeah, but that one is not a hook because uh, yeah. you no know, control of that. It's just a method that you call to get all the intrinsics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we still have to look at the uh, what's the behavior of the week because exposing the intrinsics as a slot um, might feel weird, so we might get a copy of them. So um, we'll have to see what happens if we write to them, if we delete them, write to them, what's going to happen. Good. All right, I'm done. Who's next? I have one small thing to um, suggest, and it's probably a bad idea, but I th figured I'd throw it out there if nobody else has anything for the agenda. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, this is for you, JF. Um, so an idea I had about a month ago was about... Um, SES and Jesse and all the other various levels for lack of my remembering the better term, um, how they're all implemented, I believe, using membranes, the implementation of these various levels. Um, I was beginning to wonder, would it be a good idea to write um, mocks of how they would be implemented in various existing membranes, such as the Salesforce one or ES membrane, et cetera, um, to see how to how you would export, um, say, an SES level uh, implementation to another uh, using an external library membrane. Um, one possible justification for this would be if we ever did get a uh, membrane into the ECMAScript standard, having some experience would be useful. Okay, so just to clarify, what you're saying is that because uh, SES and Jesse are implemented with membranes, uh, you would like to see those languages defined as um, in, in your um, what I'm saying is language or something like that. 
what I'm saying is it might be useful to extract the membrane specific parts of those or sure. write um, adaptations that were that could be compared against existing membrane implementations for or let me restate that written in these other membrane implementations so that the membrane part could be abstracted out as an example now if you don't want to do that that's fine it's just a suggestion yeah um i can speak a little bit about sas and probably michael can complete for for jesse um what all of the operations in SES that are related to membrane is only to uh, isolate the uh, an, an execution context from the global execution context. So if we go back to the specs, is to say that we're trying to emulate a uh, global uh, uh, environment record um, within uh, another environment record between the, inside a different one. We don't use membrane for, or the concept of anything similar to membrane for other things. Um, so you might have, uh, for example, it might not be implemented with a proxy, but you might want to inject in a new compartment and evaluate a, a console that hides the real console. Uh, it can be implemented with a, an expensive object that you create on the fly. Um, as you need it, uh, you can be, it, it can be a proxy, there are many ways to get there. But other than that, the language, the SES is defined by taking a set of intrinsics and a set of globals and removing uh, or taming the ones that, the, the methods that you don't want to, to have. Removing uh, data now, uh, math.random, and uh, also removing anything in the um, in the objects that are uh, reachable, uh, that is not an, uh, something that's defined in the language, and we have a, a deep um, inspector for that, which where we where we whitelist the properties that we uh, we deem acceptable. So there, there's no membrane, and um, I believe that Jesse and, and Michael, please complete. Jesse is most implemented by further removing and or uh, transpiling. Yeah, so um, as far as Jesse goes, uh, I was hoping originally to use the Jesse whitelist, which are the globals that it can depend on, that Jesse code is allowed to depend on. I was hoping to use that as an SES whitelist, but we probably have to do something uh, as far as I understand it, it's like what you're describing, Vincent, or Alex, sorry, <laughs> is uh, um, we need to create another evaluation context that limits what globals are accessible. And this is not needed all the time because proper Jesse code should be able to run just under SES without or with those additional globals. It just doesn't reference them. Right. Uh, so... Uh, is that kind of what you were getting at, Alex? Like as far as uh, restricting the language subset? Um, I'm not sure. And and basically, I was just thinking in terms of in terms of continuing to move uh, membrane development along. If we had some reference implementations of these restrictions, um, mm -hmm. that would be useful. Um, but again, it's just a suggestion and you're, and, and if you guys, I'm, I, I didn't hear clear yay or nay, whether you thought it was a good idea, guys. Um, I, I definitely think moving our one-off membranes to a more standard implementation is a good idea. Uh, I think you're right. It's, a, it's that the reference implementation would actually be something we could point to and say, this is how you do such and such. And uh, um, the, the two main, or the, the couple of main instances that I found of that have been the, uh, uh, what I've been calling in the module, or the Jesse module membrane, which is essentially to harden things within a Jesse module 
and to prevent the capture of this findings from outside co outside code. Uh, so there's that one, and then there's one that I'm saying for the globals. Uh, that's the second one that Jesse kind of needs. Um, but yeah, the 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 membrane around the Jesse object uh, is a substitute for having to harden things um, explicitly. But um, not every Jesse user would necessarily have to do that. They could just import this membrane as a as a as a shortcut. Um, so there's that one. There's the globals, and then there's another thing I've been finding when implementing portable metering. So I want to be able to intercept calls to uh, global endowments, like the essentially the intrinsics or the primordials, and um, cause them to bill against the metering when they get called. So that's the third kind of membrane that I've had uh, a desire to make. Um, so my understanding is those are the kinds of things that we would be candidates for reference implementations uh, if they are useful in other contexts, for sure. So what you're saying, Michael, is you have a read-only proxy, basically, to uh, fake harden? Uh, I, I started with a read-only proxy, but the thing that um, discouraged me from it was when Mark analyzed it and said, the problem is that the other side of the read-only proxy can mutate the, the objects at will. So it right. makes it hard to reason about things. So instead, I transitioned into a proxy that instead of providing a read-only view, actually does the hardening. But it does it transitively against function return values and thrown values. Oh, I see. Kind of, kind of a lazy harden? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And the, the, this capture needs the, uh, in the same way it needs the, the definition of a membrane, which is the inside and outside, or wet and dry, or whatever you have. And this capture around, the membrane around the protected objects, uh, and then on the outside of a protected object is a suspected object, is how I have it so far. And when when a protected when a protected uh, function or within a protected object is calling a suspected object, if it passes a protected this, then it gets intercepted and blocked. Uh, yeah, so that's. That's the only one that Mark so far hasn't found a way of defining in terms of static checking rules, that we probably do need a membrane type thing to enforce that. Okay. Uh, what kind of home do you think these reference implementations would have, Alex? <laughs> Any idea? You mean where would they be hosted? Um, yeah. That's a good question, and frankly, it's an open-ended one. Um, Maybe this is something more for OCAP.js as well. I can't say, speak to that. Unfortunately, I am less familiar with OCAP than I should be. <laughs> I've life of a very busy college student. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so OCAPJS dot net. What is it? Or dot org. OCAPJS.org is the discussion forum that we've been talking about various JavaScript things in relation to OCAPs. And uh, it might be nice to make an organization for them and uh, toss things like this in it. But yeah, um, I'll, I'll put it forward uh, to the other folks at Agoric and we'll see if we can make something like that that might be good to gather up all these different projects and at least forks of them from GitHub. 
Right. And as far as my project is concerned, um, like I said, I haven't been able to work on it as much as I wanted to. Um, what was I going to say? All right, it slipped, it slipped my mind what I was going to say. Um, uh, basically, I'm kind of stalled on development of it for the moment, but that should change in about four months. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I, I think it would be a reasonably good idea to have a GitHub repository or organization for OCAP.js and uh, start moving these common patterns, like the things that were captured on the eWrites website um, into code that people can use and uh, examine. Uh, did anybody else have any other topics? I don't hear any. Um, I would suggest adjournment. Sounds good. Let everybody gain an hour back. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.